Good morning, church. So today's reading is going to be from Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 21. So starting in verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And unless they are to preach, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Welcome to Desert Breeze Community Church. If you're here somewhere in the building or you're watching online, we're really glad you're with us this morning. And if you're relatively new to Desert Breeze, I want to let you in on a little something that's happening this weekend. Uh, typically, uh, our services are open and our announcements are given by our executive pastor, Matt Trusella. But Matt is on vacation this weekend. Uh, he and his wife, Deborah, are celebrating their anniversary, which is great. So, uh, so uh, Pastor Jace, our student ministries pastor, did the announcements like only Jace can do. And then uh, our senior pastor, uh, Ray Davis, uh, very graciously allowed me to have the teaching this weekend. And my name is Mark, and I'm the adult ministries pastor. So in many ways, it's like the parents have gone out of town and the kids are in charge. <laughs> And you know what happens when the kids are in charge. Usually there's a broken lamp, a back door is left open, no one knows where the dog is. And so be in prayer this weekend that the church is still standing by the time we're done leading this weekend. But really it's great to be with you uh, this morning. And uh, in the last few years, probably in the last five to seven years, uh, I have really become greatly excited about, maybe that's not the best word, interested in, I don't want to say obsessed with, but I've been really laser focused on just trying to better understand how the church and our present culture intersect with one another. And interested always in finding new research that shows uh, how is the church perceived by our culture, how is our church influencing culture, or is the church running away from culture. And uh, one individual that I have found to be very helpful uh, in finding out just what's happening on a numerical basis is a man by the name of Ryan Burge. Uh, Ryan Burge is this great intersection of, he's a pastor, uh, he's a professor at a university, and he's also an expert statistician. So Jesus and math nerd stuff, that is my wheelhouse right there. <laughs> And uh, Ryan has an organization that does a lot of research on how religion is perceived out in the world and maybe even here in the United States. And uh, I've heard him in various places and read a lot of his blogs and just some really interesting numbers that are coming out in the last few months that I think will help us in where we're going this morning. First of all, uh, there is a rising group of people in our country and even around the world that are being referred to as the nuns. N-O-N-E-S, nuns. This would be people who, when you ask them, what is your religious affiliation, they would say, I don't have any. I'm a nun. I don't have any religious affiliation at all. And 50 years ago, in 1972, the number of people who claimed to have no religious affiliation was about 5%. So one out of every 20 Americans, when asked in 1972, would say, I don't really have any religious affiliation at all. I don't really go to a church. I'm not part of any uh, large mainline organization. I just kind of keep to myself. 
In 2018, just five years ago, that same question was asked, and now it's jumped to 24%. Almost one out of every four people in our country would say they have no religious affiliation at all. They don't want anything to do with religion. Ryan's organization went on to say that their guesstimation is by 2030, just a few years away now, by 2030, nuns will probably be the largest quote-unquote religious affiliation in America. So the largest group of people in our country when it comes to religion will say, I have nothing to do with religion. Then another interesting trend that's happened in the last couple years is uh, the number of people who would claim that they are now de-churched. De-churched. They were once part of a religious organization. They once attended church regularly, and now they have left. They are de-churched. And the recent numbers have come out and have shown that since 1990, 40 million Americans are de-churched. 40 million Americans. To help put that in perspective for you a little bit, that's about 15% of the adult population would say, I, I, I'm not really part of church anymore. They're de-churched. Now, Ryan went on to break that down even further and showed that of those 40 million, about 75% of them, so it's quick math, would say about 30 million people, 30 million of the 40 million who are de-churched, when asked and probed further, they would say, well, we're what we call casually de-churched, meaning it wasn't something other than just they kind of quit going to church. Uh, for many, COVID had something to do with that, the, the, the lockdown and the pandemic. They quit going to church, and then they got into that habit, and they just have never returned. But even as far back as 1990 and working their way through, some people just, they relocate cities, and they don't find a church to be part of. Uh, that's a, a large issue with college students. When they leave home and go away to college, one of their hardest tasks is to find a church to be a part of. And so then they just kind of quit going to church altogether. Or maybe they've relocated to a new city. Some people just become busy. But for whatever reason, 75% of those 40 million would say they're just casually de-churched. They just kind of quit going and never returned. But the other 25%, which would be about 10 million people, would say, no, no, we're de-churched casualties. We experience significant hurt through our local church. We experience some kind of trauma, perhaps even abuse, or we watch leadership fail, and because of what the church did to us or our family, we have nothing to do with them anymore. Now, you pile onto that some of the other things that are happening in our culture right now, the, the rise of cancel culture. My goodness, you make a mistake and you're done for, and everyone shoves you off to the side. Uh, the popularity of deconstructing your faith, where I'm just going to break that down and throw everything away that maybe I was raised with when it comes to my religious affiliation. Tribalism, everyone moving to the extremes, and no one can be right except for the people in my group. All of these things have caused a lot of people to describe what we're now living in as post-Christian, meaning the majority of people in our culture don't really have any connection to morality, religion, church principles. That's just foreign to many of them. Now, as a result of that, many Christians just really have all sorts of fears about trying to share their faith. And you can probably resonate with this. I know I can. That in many cases, there is always a fear of rejection. No one likes to be rejected by anything, so why would I share with someone, based upon what you just told us, Mark, why am I even bothering to talk to anyone out in the culture? Maybe you're afraid of, I don't always have the right answers. Someone is going to ask me a question that I don't know how to answer, and that's a legitimate concern. Or maybe you just don't like people. <laughs> it's like, you know, I'm fine with my little huddle here. The desert people are okay. The desert breeze folks, I can handle them. But anyone else, I just, I don't want to spend the time with them. So, all of that put together begs the question, where does Jesus fit into this cultural moment? How can we proclaim Jesus to a world that clearly, in many ways, has no desire to have anything to do with Him 
or His church. And that's what we're going to try to work through this morning. Uh, I have just given you a ton of bad news, and I'm glad that you've all stayed so far. If you're online and still watching, thank you. Hang on. The good news is coming. But we needed to be good about understanding, and not in a woe is me, the sky is falling mentality, but a reality of understanding there are people in our world who are desperately hurting for Jesus, but they don't want anything to do with His people right now. And we need to flip the narrative and change and become countercultural to what they believe comes from someone who follows Jesus. And so we've been walking through uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, specifically the house churches that were in Rome at this time. And we've been saying for months now that the, the undercurrent of the letter that Paul writes to the Roman house churches is this tension and friction between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And in many ways, this, this really embodies the first century of the church that there is an influx of people who are not Jewish by birth into the family of God, the body of Christ, and there is a deep understanding that is needed by people to recognize that this is what God's plan was from the beginning, a multi-ethnic, multicultural people group, all unified around the person of Jesus. And in these three chapters we're currently walking through, Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul is really dialing down, and he is giving us a very detailed description of the fact that much like the Gentiles, those who are Jewish by birth also are in desperate need of God's salvation through Jesus. As Pastor Ray has shared with us the last few weeks, that it's, it, it's not your pedigree, it's not the law that you follow, you, just like those who are outside of the Jewish world, desperately need Jesus. And Paul is building his case for why those in the Jewish world need Jesus just like everybody else does. And we come to the second half of chapter 10, the passage that John read for us just a few moments ago, and Paul is going to reintroduce something that he has used quite often in this letter, uh, a literary device that is one of Paul's favorites, and it's when Paul creates an imaginary objector. He creates a person to have a dialogue with. And often, the individual that Paul creates, this imaginary objector, Paul uses this individual to ask the questions or make the statements that he's pretty sure his readers are asking or saying. And so, in many ways, Paul's beating them to the punch by, oh, uh, let me ask this question on behalf of someone, because you're probably asking the same question. Uh, parents, it's much like when you're talking to your children and you ask and answer the question that you know they want to ask you, and for a brief moment, you actually have the upper hand in life. Then that quickly goes away and it's back to chaos. But for that brief moment, you had insight to, oh, they want to ask me this. I will ask it for you and then answer it. That's Paul's technique here in the second half of chapter 10. And so Paul creates this imaginary objector. Why does he do this? Well, if you have your text open, if you have your Bible with you and you're in Romans 10, go up one verse above where we started this morning in verse 13. It's a statement that Paul makes in 13 that we believe triggers why he says what he says in the rest of the chapter. Because in verse 13, a very, very famous verse, one that should mean a ton to us, Paul says in verse 13 of chapter 10, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then Paul uses the imaginary objector to say, oh yeah, maybe that's the problem, Paul. Maybe that's the problem. And so here comes the imaginary objector asking three questions in the text. The imaginary objector says, okay, uh, so why hasn't Israel believed? Paul, how come? If everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, how come they haven't done that yet? Oh, I know why, Paul. Maybe they haven't really heard the gospel, which has to be a slight dig at Paul himself because all Paul does is share the gospel. So, Paul creates an imaginary objector to throw shade at himself <laughs> about, well, maybe they just haven't heard the gospel, Paul. Uh, maybe they don't understand it. Maybe it hasn't been shared with them clearly. And as we saw through the reading, Paul's response to each of these imaginary objector questions is 
Of course they have. Verse 18, well, maybe they didn't hear the gospel. Paul, yes, they did. Verse 19, maybe they didn't understand it. Yes, they did. Verses 20 and 21, then why didn't they believe? Great question. And Paul's response is this. The problem isn't that they don't know the gospel or haven't heard the gospel. The problem is that Israel, by nature, is stubborn, much like the rest of us. And their stubbornness toward God, His message, and His messengers throughout history are on display again. And I don't know if you noticed, but Paul responded to each of the fake questions by quoting Isaiah, the first prophet that comes in the list of prophets, one of the key individuals who brought the truth to Israel in the time he was alive, and the nation rejected him. So Paul isn't thinking that it's the message or the messengers that's the issue here. They know the gospel message. They're just too choosing to reject it. And so as our staff was working through this passage and we were having conversations and began to discuss what could possibly be an application from this passage for those of us here in the Desert Breeze community, we began to notice something pretty quickly. And that was this, and it's written in your notes as well, that unlike Paul's focus group, unlike the group that Paul was writing to and talking to, many of the people that we interact with today don't understand the gospel and have very little tolerance for it. The numbers I shared with you at the beginning back that up, that people don't care about the gospel, don't care about Jesus, and don't really want to know about Him other than what they personally like in their own little world. And so the question we want to talk about this morning is this, how can we effectively share the good news of Jesus in the current cultural climate that we live in our world? How can we do that? And so with Paul's words in Romans 10 as the backdrop, what I would like to do with us this morning is walk us into an ongoing conversation here at Desert Breeze. Initiate some conversations with you that hopefully you'll take to your life groups or your families or maybe at lunch today with friends and begin to think more deeply about how do we approach the people around us who desperately need Jesus? What are some ways that we can be effective in our current cultural moment? And what I want to introduce to you and offer to you as a possible solution to this is a concept that we're calling winsome Christianity. Winsome Christianity. You might not be super familiar with the word winsome. It's not like a real common word that we use in our everyday vernacular. Uh, it sounds like it's kind of a snooty word, like someone who likes to say big words and plays Scrabble a lot. That's the kind of word they would use. A winsome, oh, wow, look at you. You know, have your pinky out when you say it. I'm winsome. And yet the word is very common. Once I explain to us what it means and how we apply it, you'll say, oh, yeah, it's, it's pretty common. It's just a fancy word for something that's common. It actually predates 12th century England and was originally spelled W-Y-N-N, -N, and it really just means someone who is pleasing, someone who is engaging, someone who's full of joy. When you are winsome, people generally are attracted to you. The way you think, the way you speak, the way you behave, people like that and they're drawn to you. There's something about you that makes you interesting and intriguing. Uh, you seem to be a person that makes friends quickly. You tend to be a friend to everyone. We all know these kinds of folks, right? Where you can be in a line anywhere at any occasion, and they're already making friends, and they already know people's life stories. Oh, this is Bill. He's been living in six different countries the last few years. Like, we're just buying things at Costco. How do you, why? And so winsome has to do with this concept of being very pleasing, engaging, full of joy, drawing people into conversation with you. And I, again, I thought for a while, like, I've been hearing this word used in various places as a, as a way to think about how we engage the culture, and I was a little skeptical until about three months ago. When one night uh, I brought Panda Express home for dinner at our house, 
And after eating my Kung Pao chicken, uh, I of course grabbed my little fortune cookie that they give you and I cracked it open and pulled the little piece of paper out that was going to tell me exactly what I was supposed to do in life. <laughs> and this time, the Panda Express little paper said this, you will influence people with your winsome personality. <laughs> well, if Panda Express is on the winsome train, I'm on as, as well. I'm ready to, to roll with winsomeness. And I think also what drew me to this effect, finally after fighting it and struggling it for a while, what drew me to winsomeness was, and I've shared this with some of you in other situations, that uh, this was definitely not me in my earlier days. Uh, I was very anti-winsome in my 20s. And like a lot of people in their 20s, not the 20-year-olds we have here at Desert Breeze, but when I was in my 20s, I was like a lot of 20-year-olds, very loud and very wrong. <laughs> and I would often just verbally berate people somewhat in a kind way, but typically in a I'm going to stomp on your face in Christian love kind of way. And I was not very winsome in how I approached people in sharing the gospel. And so when I think about this idea of winsomeness, I begin to look through the New Testament, and I find lots of places, especially in the New Testament letters, where these authors are very quick to point out that this is the way they engaged culture and how we should as well. Let me share a few passages with you. The first one on there is 1 Peter 3.15. Uh, Peter says this, and keep in mind that Peter's letter is written specifically to people who are enduring intense suffering at this time in their life. And Peter says this in 1 Peter 3, always be prepared, always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And I want to pause right there for a second because did you notice that Peter has an assumption in mind when he writes those words? Peter is assuming that people are going to ask you about why you have hope and you need to have a reason to share with them. People are gonna ask you about why you have hope. Be ready to answer. So the assumption is that we're living in a way, his readers were living in a way, even in the midst of persecution, that they exuded hope, that it just came out of them, much like breathing out. And people would stop and say, wait, wait, why do you have this much hope? Oh, let me tell you. And I'm pretty sure the answer has to do with Jesus. But it's the rest of the verse that also helps us remember what winsomeness looks like because Peter then says, but do this with gentleness and respect. Paul in Colossians chapter 4, some similar words. He says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, people outside the faith. Make the most of every opportunity. Like, don't waste a moment you have engaging someone who's not part of of the faith. But instead, he says, make the most of your opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And then James. So, we've heard from Peter, we've heard from Paul, and now James. If only Mary had actually written a letter, we could have had Peter, Paul, and Mary. But instead of we have Peter, Paul, and James, and James says here in chapter 3, verse 17 of his letter, but the wisdom that comes from above is pure, then peace-loving, gentle, open to reason. Ooh, that's a tough one because I thought I had all the right answers. But I need to be open to the reason that someone else may share. Full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And then one more passage, I, I didn't list it in the notes, so if you want to jot it down, you can, uh, but it also just like really drives this point home, is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 23, it's a short paragraph from Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. And it goes like this, though I am free and belong to no one, Paul says, I have made myself a slave to everyone. And here's the phrase that I love the most from this passage, to win as many as possible. Paul, what, why do you do what you do? I want to win as many as possible. And then he goes on to explain the various details. To the Jews that become like a Jew, to win as many Jews as possible. To those who have the law, 
I act like those who have the law to win as many as possible. To those who don't have the law, I act like I don't have the law to win as many. What I try to do, I'm trying to win as many as possible. And I do all this for the sake of the gospel. I want to win as many as possible. So here's our goal when it comes to winsomeness. We want to be winsome to win some to Jesus. We want to be winsome to win some to Jesus. Be winsome to win some to Jesus. And so what does this look like? Well, winsome Christianity is all about building relationships. Building relationships. And our goal is to both show and speak the good news of Jesus. The speaking the good news is needed. But in our current culture, it seems as though there needs to be some showing of and some representing of Jesus along with the speaking of Jesus that will perhaps draw people in to who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit is still doing the work. You and I get the privilege of sharing the gospel, but we can be effective in how we share the gospel. And I think winsomeness is the answer. So just some quick pointers, some quick little tips, just some ways to think about winsomeness as you navigate through your world. Uh, first, let's talk about the posture of winsomeness for just a few short minutes. And what I mean by that is just how do we present ourselves? What's the mentality? What's the approach? You know, healthy posture in your body uh, exudes this idea that you're, you're healthy and you're strong and it's good for you. When we slump, all these bad things happen and we try to have good posture. So when it comes to being winsome in our culture, how can we have a good posture? Well, again, somewhat obvious, but still necessary to say. First and foremost, let's approach people with love, humility, and empathy. Let love, humility, and empathy be the attributes that are in our mind as we think about engaging in conversation with people. Jesus, in one of his most famous statements, probably known to even people outside of the Christian faith, comes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 12, where Jesus says, do unto others, it's a golden rule, do unto others as you want them to do to you. Notice the emphasis is on doing. It's all about relationships. See, our culture, when you ask people in our culture to define love or to explain love, what they really only could convey to you is that, well, it just means being nice. It means being polite. Jesus says it's way more than that. It's doing. It's an action. As those great theologians from the 90s, the Christian rap group DC Talk used to say, <laughs> love is a verb. Love is a verb. Humility, not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Uh, Christians often come across as arrogant know-it-alls, and we don't know it all. We might know a lot, but the humility in approaching someone is so necessary in winsomeness. And then finally, empathy. Empathy is feeling with people. Sympathy is, whoo, too bad for you. That really stinks. I feel for you a little bit. Empathy is, I'm going to step into your shoes. I'm going to think the way you think. I'm going to find out what your life is like, and I'm going to be drawn to that. I want to be a non-anxious presence, as Australian pastor Mark Sayers wrote in his book. I want to be a non-anxious presence in people's lives. And so I love them, I'm humble before them, and I'm empathetic. I want to know their story. There's a reason why they have rejected Jesus. And you knowing their story helps you better understand how to talk them through that, instead of just assuming something about them from a distance. Approach sharing Jesus as an act of service. Secondly, uh, something that I first heard from a man named Greg Kokel, who runs an organization called Stand to Reason. It's a Christian apologetics site. And he once made the comment in a talk that I heard from him where he said, the best way to approach our culture is to think this way, to respect people and then inspect the ideas. A framework that can be really healthy is to respect people and then inspect their ideas. Respect people. I approach people as who they really are, image bearers of God, worthy of honor. 
And when I approach people with that framework, that then perhaps opens the door for us to take the ideas that are in discussion and inspect them. Respecting you as a person allows us to, to take those apart and go, you I respect, let's talk about these ideas. What Greg went on to say, which I found was fascinating and really spot on, was he said, our culture has actually flipped those. That our culture right now, what they are respecting above all else are their ideas. You respect my ideas. My ideas and my people are always right. And then if you don't respect my ideas, their response is, I'm going to inspect you. You're intolerant. You're ignorant. You're dangerous. So an attitude of respecting people first and foremost, and then once that respect is understood, perhaps then we can inspect the ideas is helpful in being winsome. Next, and this just is true in all areas of life, and that's that questions are always better than statements. Questions are always better than statements because questions draw people in. Statements tend to push people away. Some of my favorite questions to ask people as I'm engaging them in religious conversations is just simple things like this. Wow, that's really interesting. How did you arrive at that belief? How did you come to think that or believe that? I'm really curious. Curiosity is huge in being winsome. And not because I'm like fake curious, like <laughs> I'm just waiting for them to say something I can pounce on. No, I really care about what they believe and why. It'll help me better understand how to engage them. Oh, that is interesting. Would you tell me more about that? Tell me more about that is huge, ladies and gentlemen. Tell me more about that allows them to enter into a greater conversation. And what you'll often find is at some point, people even will run out of understanding themselves what they believe, and suddenly they begin to question, why do I, yeah, why do I believe that? Like, yeah, I thought that was really fascinating. Instead of saying, here's what's wrong with what you believe, and here's five reasons why, and I'll probably even make it an acrostic, that's how good I am. <laughs> Instead, I ask questions. The power of listening, the power of curiosity. And then finally, when it's time to communicate what we believe, when it's time to communicate our convictions, just like Jesus balanced grace and truth, we want to communicate our convictions with clarity and compassion. Communicate my convictions with clarity and compassion. I am very clear on what I believe and why I believe it. But I'm also very honored to have you in the conversation. And I want to be compassionate because, again, folks, we need to remind ourselves that people who don't have Jesus are hurting and broken and desperate. We forget that sometimes, and we immediately put them on a shelf of they are undesirable or they're just ignorant or they're annoying. And instead, let's draw them in for who they really are, a people who desperately are looking for truth and don't know where to find it. Because I'm not in this to dominate an opponent. I'm in this to develop a relationship. And so finally, uh, just some simple little tactics. So we've talked about the mindset, the posture that we should have as we think about engaging people in conversations. And then just some ways to simply share the gospel with people in a way that, that, that doesn't require a lot of heavy lifting. I know all of us think like we have to study, 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 and that's very good. And I am all for knowing better about what we believe and why. But you right now, as a follower of Jesus, are fully equipped to share His message. You are fully equipped. And here's just a couple simple ways to remind us of that and to encourage us as we enter into the week. So some tactics of winsomeness. The first one, simplify. Simplify. As Christians, we tend to make things really complicated. We're really good at making things complex. And when I look at the Scriptures and I think about the gospel message, it's actually laid out to be fairly simple. If it's simple enough for children to understand and believe, then maybe we need to think more about making it not as complex. There is this great episode in the middle of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15. Uh, let me set the scene for you. Uh, the church has been just growing and growing and growing uh, Paul and his buddy Barnabas have just come back from their first missionary journey into Galatia, where now Jews and Gentiles are believing in Jesus by the hundreds and thousands. Peter has just had his interaction with a, a man named Cornelius, 
who was, as Peter describes it, the first time he set foot into a Gentile's home is to watch Cornelius and his family believe in Jesus. And so all of the heavyweights within Christian leadership at this time have gathered together in Jerusalem for a council meeting to talk about this Jew-Gentile conundrum. And here are some of the things that are said by the leaders at that meeting. First in Acts 15, 10, and 11. This is Peter talking. And Peter said this, why do you try to test God, everyone who's quabbling over this, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? Why are we taking the Old Testament Jewish law, they wouldn't call it the Old Testament Jewish law, but the Jewish law, why are we taking that and forcing that on top of the uh, minds of the Gentiles when we as a people couldn't do it ourselves? Why are we putting this, and he uses the word yoke, why are we putting this heavy burden upon them? No, and he has realized this, love this statement from Peter, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. A couple verses later, James steps up. In James, uh, Acts 15.19, James' statement here in Acts 15.19, I actually have this reference written on the whiteboard in my office to constantly remind me of these words. James says this, Acts 15, 19, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Let's not make it difficult. Let's simplify. And you know how you simplify? You make it all about Jesus. You make it all about Jesus. Well, I have a question about uh, old earth versus young earth creation. That's a great question. We'll talk about it at some point, but can I tell you about Jesus? Well, you know, every church and every pastor at a church, all they want to do is just steal your money. That might be true, but let's talk about Jesus. Bring it back to Jesus, the core of our faith and who He is, and also share your testimony. This is the beauty of following Jesus is that you have a story that you've experienced that points people to Jesus. And no one can ever say to your testimony, to your personal story, well, that didn't happen. <laughs> it's your story. <laughs> Unless you're making things up, it happened. And you can point people to Jesus. You know, I was like this, but Jesus came into my life. So now, here's what life is like moving forward. Let's simplify. Second thing, let's clarify. Let's clarify. If we're trying to make it a little more simple, let's not make it hard for people, let's not put burdens on people that they can't handle at that moment in time. We also want to clarify. And when people have asked me over the years, like, what's the best, most concise, yet very truthful way to share the gospel with someone? Like, what's just the big, take it down to its core essence. I always tell people, look at what Paul says in the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15. Because Paul says, hey, by the way, Corinthians, here is the gospel. Let me share this passage with you. Paul starts this way in, in chapter 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. I preach to you. You received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you were saved. So what Paul is about to write is, in Paul's mind, the gospel if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. And then I love what Paul says here, for what I received, Paul received this, most likely from those early disciples, I now pass on to you as of first importance. And there is some discussion as to whether these next statements that Paul makes had maybe begun to become an early creed within the church, that this was statements that were being put together and galvanized into here's what we believe. And look what Paul says, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared first to Cephas, and if you're not familiar with that, Cephas is the Aramaic name for Peter, so he's mentioning Peter there. He appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. And what's great is Paul says, as I'm writing this, if you wanted to, you could hop on a boat or hop on the road and go back to Israel, go to the Jerusalem area, and a lot of these people were still alive. They will tell you what they saw. Some have passed away, but many are still living. 
Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one untimely born. Paul kind of minimizes himself. Yeah, I wasn't on the train right away. I was persecuting Christians and I became one, but at least I now know the truth. Did you notice the four things that Paul said about Jesus in that passage? Jesus died, taking care of our sins. Only way our sins could be taken care of, a perfect sacrifice. Jesus was buried, proving he was dead. Jesus was raised, wait a second, only God could do that, yes, and to prove that it happened, he appeared. Jesus died, buried, raised, appeared. So much so that Paul later in that letter, later in that chapter, says in verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, if this isn't true, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. That's how critical the resurrection is. See, this is what I love about what we believe. The early church hinged their faith on a person, the God-man Jesus, and the event that only He could do, raised from the dead. And that event and what they saw is what they believed because if the resurrection is not true, there's no reason to believe in Jesus, no reason to accept Him. But if the resurrection is true, there's no reason to reject Jesus because no one else has done that. And as I've said before, when they went to the empty tomb, nobody expected to find nobody. <laughs> and yet He was raised from the dead. So let's clarify. Lastly, let's unify. Let's unify. As much as the church seems fractured and divided, we can begin to preach the message of we are all one in Jesus. We simplify, we clarify, we unify. Jesus in the upper room in John 13 with His disciples said, a new commandment I give to you, love one another. And if you're not sure how to do that, He then says, love people the way I loved people. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. This is how people will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. And then a couple chapters later, in chapter 17, as Jesus is in the garden, awaiting His betrayal, He says in John 17, 20 and 21, I do not ask for these things only, but also for those who will believe in Me through their word. Do you realize Jesus just prayed for you and me? Jesus says, I'm not just praying for the people who are with me right now. I am praying for those who will believe in me through the word of these early followers of me, that they may all be one. Simplify, clarify, unify. Now, one last little comment on this, and then I'll wrap it up. Uh, this unity that Paul is talking about in Romans 9, 10, 11 is the unity that Jesus just mentioned here. And on Wednesdays, not sure if you know this or not, but on Wednesdays, all our staff gets together in the morning, and we have a staff meeting, but we also have some devotion time. And whoever's doing the weekend teaching will share the text and walk through the message. And it's a great time. We have a, it's, it's so great. I, I'm still pinching myself, now having been here a year, that we get to do this on a regular basis, that we sit with the Word as a staff and walk through it. And it's very fun, very enjoyable. We we try to toss out jokes that the speaker would then use that weekend, um, but then we never get credit for them. So, you know, everyone thinks Ray is funny. It's really Jason and I. Um, but anyway, uh, and so we got done walking through this, and uh, Pastor Matt Trusella, our executive pastor, said, you know, Mark, you're missing one in your uh, tactics there. I was like, okay, I'll, I'm willing to listen to you. You're going to be wrong, but I'm willing to listen to you. He said, no, 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 we need one more. We need multiply. I'm like, oh, that's, that's good. Multiply. He goes, no, no, we need multiply because then it spells scum. <laughs> Which Mila, I said, oh, I get it. Win scum Christianity. Win scum Christianity. That's what we need. We need to be scummy for Jesus. Let's go be scummy for Jesus. And so, yes, simplify, clarify, unify. If we do those things, probably then, yes, the body of Christ will multiply. All right, a few final thoughts, and you have your notes in front of you, uh, but just let me walk through them just real quickly here at the end. It's important that we understand that what I've shared this morning, this winsome Christianity mindset, this is not just a new trendy evangelism tool. 
We're not trying to market and sell this. Hey, this is the new way to share Jesus. No, sharing Jesus has always been sharing Jesus. It's not a tricky tool. It's not a way to lure. We're not trying to bait and switch people into following Jesus. This is a way of life. This is an attempt to align our words and actions with the words and actions of Jesus so that we demonstrate the hope of salvation that's in Jesus by loving people the way Jesus loved people. Because as I have learned through the hard way, but I have learned over the years that often what we need to do is first show Jesus to people because that then allows us to earn the opportunity to then talk about Jesus. And I still want to talk about Jesus, but I need to show him first. Because as a, a, a pastor that I follow that just very wise man has done a lot of great ministry, especially when it comes to sexuality and gender, and he's had a, a great impact on people in those worlds. In his book, Embodied, he closed with these words, truth will not be heard until grace is felt. Truth will not be heard until grace is felt. Imagine the impact winsome Christianity could have in our communities, in our city, in our state. Imagine the impact winsome Christianity could have here at Desert Breeze. Imagine how it could impact you. Let's pray together. Father, uh, it is an incredible privilege uh, to talk about you. It's an honor, it's a pleasure it's so exhilarating as I have conversations with folks around here who have shared you with people. Whether we see someone come to you or not, it's just, it's such a, a thrilling moment to be connected to you in that way. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us, that we would not be fearful or wishing to abandon the culture that we live in, but that we would engage it head on. And we would learn to be skillful learn to be tactful, uh, learn to be strategic, but just love people and show you Jesus and be winsome, drawing people into you because of how we speak, how we think, how we act. We're so grateful for you, Jesus. What a great morning to celebrate you. Thank you for that. We love you and we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here this morning. Uh, have a great week. Take care.